I believe strongly at Earpiece, the heart and soul of the business processes that really run this company. But I think there is really this movement to sort of ERP plus and that plus really being the ability to leverage all of the data from the transactions in your system. This is the ERP Organizational Change Journal podcast, brought to you by Nestle & Associates, a Newport Beach, California-based ERP organizational change management firm serving the private equity industry. The ERP OCJ seeks to share expertise, insight, experience, and research, and to create effective conversation to help guide ERP organizational change to real, measurable, and verified success. And now, here's your ERP expert and host, the founder of Nestle & Associates, Dr. Jack Nestle. Hey, Jack here. In this episode, we will discuss a specific ERP vendor, Epicor. What is Epicor? How are they unique? Objective research suggests that there is one best solution for each and every unique organization, but what does that really mean? The organization needs to take the time and the effort to find that one best fit without making assumptions. Research suggests that ERP system selection, implementation methodology, and partner selection is critical for a successful ERP organizational change project. Let's explore Epicor with Lisa Pope. Lisa has held roles as president, board member, revenue officer, digital transformation leader, and has had global experience in ERP implementations. Lisa is currently president of Epicor, where she is a member of the Epicor executive team responsible for driving growth across key verticals, including manufacturing, retail, and distribution. Lisa has 30 years of leadership in the software industry, specifically including digital transformation leadership. Lisa was also Woman of the Year in 2022, Stevie Awards for Sales and Customer Service, where she was recognized for her customer-centric approach, strategically leading and scaling partnerships, and effective mentorship in women empowerment efforts. Since joining Epicor, Lisa has increased diversity at the leadership level, promoting and hiring women for key roles, now comprising 20% of her management team. The Stevie Awards for Sales and Customer Service are the world's top honors for customer service, contact center, business development, and sales professionals. And I will add that Lisa has great experience with positions at Oracle, QAD, and Four as well as Epicor. So let's learn more with our next guest. Joining us from the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Lisa, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jack. I really appreciate being here. Really excited, Lisa. It's uh, really a privilege and an honor to have you with us today. So I'm really looking forward to sharing uh, your insight with our listeners. So before we get started, just a note here for our listeners. We do know that there are nearly 100 discrete manufacturing ERP vendors. Some ERP vendor solutions cater to specific industries, while some cater across industries. Some come with industry-specific configurations and have hundreds of pre-configured business processes. Some cater to specific niches with little configuration. Some have been around since the beginning of the ERP era, and some that we don't know about yet will bring to the market new and exciting products with creativity and innovation. ERP solutions utilize different models and often cater to different business needs. Some have all the bells and whistles and try to be everything to everyone. Others are very industry specific and cater to a niche market. They often employ technology differently and have different approaches to functionality, implementation, and business modeling. They have different competitive differentiators that drive how they advertise and approach the market. And there is free and open source ERP and there are proprietary ERP vendors as well. And of course, there are ERP vendors that focus on add-ons only. But what really matters and what really makes for an organization success is being mindful of how critical the triad, what we call the triad, the people, processes, and technology is, and hence the true differentiators that ERP solutions and vendors bring to the table. As mentioned, today we will discuss Epicor, their differentiators, the definition of success, ERP selection, ERP success rate, ERP challenges, and the future of ERP and emerging technologies and more. So Lisa, first, please tell us more. Uh, please introduce yourself further to our listeners, if you would, please. Well, thanks, Jack. You did such a great job with my history. I really appreciate it. But I have been in uh, the ERP uh, business for about 25 years, um, really focused on very specific verticals across manufacturing, distribution, retail, and also a little bit of healthcare and government in my early days. Um, and I think that industry expertise really did give me a unique perspective on solving clients' business issues versus selling software. And I think that's really you know, the main thing that I bring to the table is sort of a customer focus approach. Um, and I'm excited to be at Epicor because that's certainly an area that we focused on continuing to develop and expand. 
Well, thank you, Lisa. Well, so Lisa, in general, can you elaborate a little bit more on Epicor? Uh, what is Epicor? Who, who is it? What is it? And who are your customers? Well, great. We are known um, pretty much as a ERP software company, and I'm sure we'll talk more about what that means. Um, but our goal and our focus is really providing mission critical applications to really a select market. We like to call it the makers, the movers, and the sellers, which are basically manufacturing, distribution, and retailers really across essential businesses. So if you think about sort of the essential supply chain, um, all of the businesses that were open during the pandemic is a great example. That is really the the market that we serve. Uh, We recently just surpassed a billion dollars, and I think that says a lot about our growth, but also the success we've had with larger clients and larger customers um, across the board. So when we look at our clients, we literally have customers that are everything from a small family-owned business like your local Ace Hardware store uh, that you visit on a Saturday and and stock up, um, all the way to billion-dollar public global enterprises. So our focus is very much not so much focused on size, but really across that supply chain. And many have leveraged our applications, you know, obviously to help fuel their growth within those respective industries. Got it. So Lisa, how how would you define ERP for our listeners? Well, that's a great question. You know, I remember um, when I first got into the ERP business, right, it obviously stands for Enterprise Resource Planning. And that's really the traditional way of saying that it is the backbone of software really running the critical business processes. Um, I think it's interesting, though, if you ask someone getting out of college today what ERP is, they won't know. So I think, you know, really when I look at it today, I think the shift we've had is that um, ERP is no longer just an acronym. It's really focused on being a platform for digital transformation. Uh, So many companies know they need to continue to evolve and change in order to be more competitive. And I think that's exciting for ERP. So at Epicor, you know, it's ERP plus, right? It's a critical foundation for any company. And it may not just involve, uh, as you said, the critical business processes that were once associated with it, but a number of these very strategic point solutions that sort of surround the ERP and are integrated that can provide even extra capability uh, in many cases. Lisa, that's well said. I like that explanation and definition. You'd mentioned that it's a platform and a foundation for transformation. That sure is the truth. I tell our clients all the time that it's really that cornerstone, right? You, you get the system in place, especially you know for new implementations. And the idea there, it's a continuous improvement tool for years to come. There's always opportunities for, for transformation and, and to take the business to the next level once you have the right ERP system in place. Um, So Lisa, this is actually one of my favorite questions because we focus a lot on this idea of what is success, but suppose you're leading a kickoff meeting for an organization that is just starting an ERP implementation. How would you define and describe for them success in terms of ERP organizational change? Yeah, that is absolutely the million dollar question, right? And I think You know, when we work with clients, we really want to focus in on the business objectives, the growth of the company and how the technology can enable not just growth, but really better serve their customers. So they are differentiated in the market. I think we see um, too many organizations focused on re-implementing their legacy system and the old processes that, you know, they've either inherited or are comfortable with. Uh, And I think the real key to success is to take the opportunity to really rethink not just where you are today, but where you want to be, leverage industry best practice and really ensure you're creating a flexible platform that can help you fuel your business objectives. Because, you know, certainly, as we've all seen over the last two and a half years, many, especially in our industries, had to radically shift what they made um, based on what people needed um, and needed to be able to do that quickly. They needed to be able to, you know, sell products and have store pickup uh, out in the parking lot instead of customers coming in and actually purchasing it and having a a platform and a partner that will help you sort of address those real time businesses as they happen, I think is, is really key. So I think that's the main thing is definitely don't implement what you have. Think about creating, you know, a platform for the future. 
Yeah, that's great insight. You know, the idea of building that foundation for the future and being adaptable. I mean, it's well understood that adaptable organizations are more successful in the long run. So being able to select an ERP system and a, an ERP vendor and an ERP partner that can help you guide through that, uh, through change and be flexible enough to accommodate is a very important key to success uh, for sure. So Lisa, would you agree that the ERP system selection is one of the most crucial decisions to be made during an ERP organizational change endeavor? Well, I think it is about the software, but it's equally about the partners that you choose, right? ERP, unlike some software applications, is a very, very, very long-term relationship, right? So the partners you select um, that help you through not just the selection process, but as well as the partner you select to actually implement and continue to support your company needs to really be a top priority. I think 10 years ago, you can look back and most companies bought a product, hired an implementer, and then basically were sort of stuck supporting that system themselves with a little bit of help here and there and and maybe some phone support from their software provider. Um, And what we saw happen, honestly, is we fell behind on releases right? Customers didn't stay current. It was complex. It was difficult. They had other business priorities. And then certainly the asset they purchased, that ERP system, lost value over time. So I think one of the things that um, is great about today is, you know, the software, the partnership. And then if you do decide to, to look at software as a service, we definitely see clients getting more value by having even a stronger long-term relationship where They can really focus on running their business and serving their customers and allow their ERP partners, um, both software and implementation, to take on more of the systems, right? The complex security, right? The reliability, the high availability, and ensuring most of all that that software stays current. So I think all the reason why partnership and who you are working with is equally as important as the software. Yeah, absolutely. So Lisa, I want to dig into Epicor's differentiators a little bit more. And I know Epicor well, but now I want to uh, share some of these differentiators with our listeners. So with so many options, you know, there's so many marketing. And, and I have to say, Lisa, I've asked other ERP vendors the same question. Uh, but with so many options and so many marketing and sales approaches, many organizations have never been through an ERP selection previously how can organizations focus on looking at the true differentiators with ERP vendors? So what I mean by that, you know, I tell people and our clients all the time that during the sales pitch, you can often swap the logos on the same you know, sales slide deck and, the rest, and they all seem to say the same thing. And, and I'm not suggesting that with Epicor, but what do you say about that? What are some of the things to consider when trying to understand the true differentiators between ERP options during a selection process and especially the partner, you know, the ERP vendor, not just the product? Yeah, t- totally agree. The number of ERP companies right now is, is absolutely over overwhelming. Uh, And obviously, I've worked for a few of them myself. And in some ways, that gives me great perspective because Epicor is not a fit for everyone, just like the other ERP companies are not as well. And so I think there are strong differences between the companies and their focus. And it really comes back to the client, you know, working with their selection partners to ensure that they do their due diligence. And anyone who's trying to rush you through the process, then you know, that, that probably should raise a question. But I think first and foremost, um, especially for ERP, again, not so much for maybe a point solution like CRM or HR, but yeah. it, when it comes to mission critical ERP, I think having a partner who can provide both the software and the individuals who specialize in your specific industry, I think that's critical. And, and I don't mean broad industry like manufacturing, but really able to take it down to a sub vertical level so that it, you know, they're talking about projects and how you handle that in aerospace defense or, you know, it's not just distribution. You're getting into the issues around electrical distribution, um, dealers that may be involved and retail outlets that are, are part of that environment and really making sure that the vendor speaks your language. Um, This really ensures that you're getting a fit for purpose application and I think eliminates risk. So for me, first and foremost, uh, if I think about even Epic going out to look at software solutions, and we certainly have somebody who understands what we do every day and can drill down is key. Um, The second thing that sort of goes along with that is reference checks, right? I do believe references tell the truth. 
And I think it's really important to speak to other clients in your industry that use the software, uh, not the ones that are provided by the vendor. Those are important too, because I think uh, I look at my customers and they will call me after they do a reference and tell me, well, this is what they asked and here's what I said. And I think in most cases, people do tend to be very real about the pros and cons and also, you know, what they could have done potentially better uh, if there were challenges in the project. But we also encourage people to reach out to other sources, right? Industry associations. Um, you can find uh, people on LinkedIn and similar industries. And that's a great way to get a good read on just pros and cons. And if possible, attending a company's user conference as a guest, I think, is an excellent chance for you to hear more about their vision, but also to speak to many of their customers sort of off the grid. A third thing that I think is key is, is really executive alignment. I'm involved with a number of steering committees, and I think access at the executive level between both companies really does ensure that company strategies and priorities are aligned. So I think it's important to do that in the pre-selling process as well as an ongoing basis. So, And if those meetings are really hard to schedule with one of the vendors, that sort of sends a pretty strong message about you know, their philosophy and potentially the service that you'll get afterward. Yeah. Um, and then finally, my favorite, you know, that I always say is the demo, right? Don't be enamored by the shiny, prettiest toy. Make sure there's some substance behind the facade because there are lots of ways to make a demo look incredibly great. And at the end of the day, um, that's why I think the reference checks, the industry focus, um, making sure there's executive engagement means that the decision doesn't become the demo. Good points. You know, as you'd mentioned, finding the right ERP system that's a good industry fit, and not only that, but it, it models your business well. You know, you may have ERP systems that kind of cater to the same industry, but the way they model your business could be different. The other point, you know, features and functions, let's call it. So the functionality within the application, I mean, they, you know, a lot of them do finance, a lot of them do accounts payable and accounts receivable, but sometimes they do it very differently, even for something that basic. And then, as you mentioned, one of the things we put a lot of emphasis on, of course, is what we call the intangibles, you know, outside of the industry fit, the business model, then the features and the functions is, you know, what's the implementation methodology? You know, how, how mature is it? How well thought out is it? The reference checks are critical. When an ERP vendor gives you several references and then your references give you references and they all check out, I mean, that's pretty good proof in the pudding. Yes. Um, and then I really like what you said about the executive alignment. I think that is absolutely critical. That's key. And especially, uh, you mentioned a good point. That's not just a, a post sales, you know, post sign on the line thing. It's a pre-sales thing. And, and it's really a way to see how badly the ERP vendor wants to earn your business, right? Exactly. Um, exactly. So I, I think that was a great point. Um, so how would you describe your general understanding of ERP implementation success rates in the field? And, and I'm not just talking about Epicor, but just in general, what's that look like in general? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, across, you know, the four companies that I've worked with, I really do believe the success rates can vary greatly. And I think one of the biggest challenges is making sure that as a company, you have a clear understanding of what is success. You know, there was a time when success was literally just measured by, well, we got the software implemented on time and on budget, you know, check the box. Right. And I think, you know, when you look at that, I think now we're really shifting to focus on business outcomes. So what are the metrics in the business we're trying to change? How do we make sure that we have a way to measure them, not just once we go live, but throughout the life cycle? Uh, so I think a value-based approach to defining success versus just time and money are really how leading companies are sort of viewing this true business transformation. Yeah. Um, I know at Epicor, we offer a value engineering process where we sort of you know, work with them during the early stages of a project. In many cases, they may have done that and used that for part of their business justification, but we want to make sure that we're engaged, we're aware, that we're involved in that, and that we're working to help them measure that. Um, and then we do use a customer engagement value workshop to continue to work with the client on an annual basis. So about a year after they're implemented, we come back in and, and look and say, okay, what's changed in your business? You know, maybe it's an acquisition, it's new leadership. Um, how are we doing on the metrics? Are there new goals? And in that case, a lot of times we'll find if, you know, if there's been turnover in the company, 
They may have only been trained on part of the product because somebody just taught them how to do eight things. Yeah. So we find it as a great opportunity to go back and revisit and get them re-energized on how they could get additional things from the software without having to go buy other products or solutions. So I think that's really the difference to me is having it a, a continuous life cycle of getting value from the product versus thinking of it as a start and a stop. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Being on time and on budget, it doesn't mean a whole lot if you don't get the desirable business outcomes. And if that's the case, if you're on time and budget, but don't get the desirable business outcomes, then that means you probably didn't do, as you mentioned, put the work in on the front end uh, to make it sure that you are planning appropriately, you're defining success, you're understanding what your main goals and objectives are, you know, with the whole project. So exactly. Great point. You are listening to the ERP Organizational Change Journal podcast, dedicated to private equity stakeholders, practitioners, and researchers seeking ERP organizational change success. So Lisa, what would you say are some of the most significant challenges then in an ERP organizational change effort? I agree with you in general, there's a pretty wide range of success, you know, out in field, out in practice, and that in part really depends on how organizations define success. But even with that, I think most would agree that ERP implementation can be pretty, pretty challenging, right? Um, But what what would you say are some of the most significant challenges that you've seen throughout your career and and in your experience for an ERP organizational change project? Well, I think the first one we've talked quite a bit about, which was just, you know, the selection process, right? And really making sure you have assistance during that process. Uh, You can waste, I think, a great deal of time and effort sort of kicking tires. So putting some thought into that before you just jump in, right? I think that's that's really important. I think secondly is just, you know, resource challenges today, right? Everybody already has a day job. Many already have some extra tasks known as that, you know, night job. And then you're like, okay, we're going to start an ERP transformation project. You know, how do you find time for your A players to be critical to the project, but still do their jobs? So we see so many companies really struggle with this and, I think ultimately there's not an easy solution, right? You may need to add more outside resources to staff some areas and then focus on having internal leaders on some of the high impact areas. But I think this is a a challenge across the board, um, really in many industries today is, is making sure that you can get the right team engaged and involved. And as I said, be open to finding, you know, outside resources to help in this effort so that your team uh, doesn't get burned out. Yeah. And then the, the third thing that I see happen quite a bit is this project paralysis, sort of getting stuck on a specific business process change or, you know, a discussion around a modification. And I think that can cause a lot of delays, especially if people are trying to put in, say, a global core model where they're actually trying to get multiple divisions sort of on board with a new change. And so I think that's where I really do believe it's it's critical to have that steering committee that's empowered to make changes quickly. And we always recommend, again, that the steering committee also contain executives from both companies, your software, your implementation partners, because we feel that that helps make sure there's transparency and visibility. I personally sit on a number of our larger client steering committees, you know, and it really does help keep honest, open communication and you're able to resolve things, I think, much quicker before any project ever gets into that orange or red status, right? You're able to, to jump on things quickly and, and get those done. And then finally, the, the only other thing I would mention is I, I do think companies are struggling with the, the old model of sort of this 18 to 24 month lengthy project. Uh, you know, we do quite a bit of work with private equity and in, in the industries that we serve. And one of the things that I find really refreshing about the way they sort of think and work is they're like, Lisa, we can't take six months to select a, a company. Yeah. We may only own a company for three years. And so we need, we need to move quickly. We want to, you know, we want to have a short list of, of software providers that we know fit these specific industries. We want to be able to, you know, have them come in quickly, meet with our teams, you know, do more of a rapid selection process, um, have, heavily leveraging obviously references and success, and then quickly get time to value. So maybe doing shorter phases 
um, instead of the big, you know, um, 24 month project. And I do think that projects that are run like that more with reiterative um, success versus the big bang uh, can certainly help companies stay motivated and help people stay focused. But regardless, you know, the due diligence still needs to be done. Yeah, great insight, great points. And I do agree. I I think it's such a a critical point to be made. And that is the time to value idea just with a project with an ERP organizational change project in general, but but with the selection as well. And there certainly is a right way to go about an effective selection process. And as you mentioned in your, your initial response to the question, you know, a lot of organizations could really end up heading down a path that takes some uh, takes a lot of time, money, and effort, and down various rabbit holes trying to figure out what solution to go with. So I agree uh, with you there for sure. Um, and then the resource management piece, we see that probably on every single project. And you're trying to implement an ERP system, which is a significant endeavor for the organization typically. And it doesn't come for free in terms of resources, right? The businesses, they, they have a business to run. They've got to get product out the door. And then on top of that, you're asking uh, a lot of the stakeholders to take perhaps 20 to 25% of their time on a weekly basis and put it towards an ERP implementation. Um, so that is such a such a critical critical factor. And then I also really liked how you had mentioned this idea of iterative, you know, it's, it's kind of an iterative process and the idea of paralysis by analysis. And I think the, the way I think about that, Lisa, is, um, you know, sometimes you just got to make sure you're heading in the right direction, but you don't always have to be perfect. You don't always have to have the answer necessarily. So what I mean by that is, you know, when you first start out a project, you may have some people uh, head north, some east, some west, some south, and that's not good. You know, you want to get everybody where they're heading in the same direction. They're all heading west, and then eventually they're all heading down the same trail, right? Uh, so, you know, they're aligned, but that takes some time. And I think it's also okay for organizations to understand that when you implement an ERP, it's okay to try some different things. It's okay to use it as a tool for organizational learning. It's, it's okay. You're not going to succeed at every, everything that you try to implement typically on the first try. You know, you can take a step back, reflect and say, hey, well, you know, we tried something new here. We took advantage of a new, new opportunity. Didn't quite work. So let's realign and try something different. And I think that for organizations that aren't honest and realistic about that uh, and, and they just shoot for constant paralysis by analysis because they want every step to be perfect. I, I'm not sure that that's, um, that that's being honest. Yeah, good point. Well, Lisa, what do you have to say about the future of ERP in general? Um, what are some of the innovations and the emerging technology driving ERP in 2022? Any thoughts on AI and chatbots and predictive analytics or anything like that? Yes, yes, yes. So <laughs> I, um, this is exciting for me because, as I said, I've been in the industry a really long time. And so I've been through all the various phases, right, from you know, when you, um, the software was hardware specific and we had to bring the hardware to the customer uh, to show the product, right? All the way yeah. to the year 2000, where everybody had to modernize because the whole world was going to shut down, you know? And so this is really, for me, um, a big transformation that I'm seeing that I think is exciting because, as I said, I still believe strongly ERP is the heart and soul of the business processes that really run this company. Mm -hmm. But I think there is really this movement to sort of ERP plus and that plus really being the ability to leverage all of the data from the transactions in your system. And in many cases, your supply chain's data as well, and really be able to make some impactful business decisions. So you know, instead of just focusing on software as a service, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in sort of this data as a service, which is really the next evolution, you know, providing that critical business insights to maybe what product should be built or distributed, you know, based on demand or other factors like weather season, you know, what auto parts are most likely to fail based on location, make, model, weather, um, and really being able to make business decision to maximize revenues or potentially reduce costs. So wow. we do see tremendous interest in AI and IoT, especially um, in manufacturing, right? Where we have clients uh, that use sensors to detect temperature variations in a warehouse, for example, um, with a controlled product, say a vaccine, you know, that might indicate action or spoilage would need to be taken immediately. So. I think there's many options now to really extend your ERP foundation with all of these new technologies, but we kind of go back to 
you know, the truth, which is if you're on an older legacy ERP application, it is really hard to leverage and easily integrate a lot of these emerging technologies. And so, you know, one of the first things we really look to do when we work with clients is really encourage them to take that first step is modernize their ERP wherever possible. If they can get to the cloud, right? Because integrations can be, can be much easier and it is a little bit more plug and play. Yeah. Um, and I think that sort of sets a really great foundation to then layer on uh, all this, this new exciting things that, you know, are, are coming out. Yeah. The, I think the future of ERP is going to be very exciting, especially in terms of the technologies. So in terms of the Epicor product specifically, what are the emerging technologies that Epicor is actually building or plans to build over the next couple of years that you think will act as a true competitive differentiator for Epicor from other ERP players? Is there any one specific emerging technology that's the focus of Epicor at this point? You know, I, I think there's a couple. I mean, um, for me, uh, the data is a big one. And I think part of it is the industries we serve, right? Because we have the manufacturer, the distribution, distributor, and the retailers. And so if you think about potentially the products that are sold in an ACE hardware, that point of sale data, what's selling, what's not, um, many of those products are distributed with our products and made with our products. And so that's data across that supply chain is extremely valuable. So the monetization of that data, the ability for customers to then get insights, you know, across all the industry, I think is, is big. And so that's unique to sort of our value proposition. And I think that will be key, but certainly automation is big for us. So just automating, not just integrations, but business processes. Um, AI is also very important. So predicting supply chain disruptions based across those supply chain indicators. And then finally, I do think IoT, right, um, the Internet of Things, and just making sure we have connected workflows. You know, I think one example that is really great is, you know, uh, taking workflows with sensors that sort of create a digital twin, which what that means is it would allow us to take sort of real-time data and intelligence from the ERP, right, from Epicor, and really improve the end-to-end processes from manufacturing flows on the shop floor, um, and ultimately really providing better insights on delivery dates, you know, downtime impacts. So I think, you know, it's really putting those pieces together. And I think technology is technology. Um, one of the things that I think is really important and our focus with Epicor is sort of this made with you for you. So, you know, we focus on working with our customer on these emerging technologies. We don't rush to go build something cool and hope that our clients will want it. Uh, We tend to work with the customers that are sort of very leading edge that want to do this with us. And then we look at the business and the use case and we sort of build it. And I think that approach has allowed us to do some really cool things, but also not just rush to, um, you know, go out and buy a company because they are the, like I said, the shiny new toy and uh, and you're leaving the customer to figure out how to actually integrate it and leverage it. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. There's a lot of uh, very interesting emerging technologies out there. But if at the end of the day, they don't bring any value to a business and there's no use case, then then is it really necessary? Well, Lisa, what, what do you think is more likely? Uh, number one, a near perfect success with no major challenges or two, some challenges with the organization endures, usually due to a strong culture and therefore success. <laughs> Well, nearly perfect always sounds ideal, but, you know, it comes down to time, money, and I think fatigue. I mean, you brought this up earlier. Um, perfect usually means delays and a lot of, you know, analysis, right? And so there is fatigue at the project level, certainly at the executive level as projects get overrun. And I think one big area that a lot of companies overlook is what is going to be the impact at the customer level. Right. They can often be impacted by an ERP change in terms of how they interact with the company and also just the disruption that it can cause. So I prefer the second. Um, I actually think a team that faces some challenges together sort of increases that stickiness of not just the project, but the people. Um, and I think the people factor is a huge focus for us here at Epicor. You know, given the war on talent and the importance of sort of retaining your key team, 
one of the things we really encourage, you know, very similar to building a house is what's your contingency plan, right? So, you know, you picked out this tile and this bathtub, but with supply chain disruptions, the bathtub will be here, you know, six months. Yeah. Is it, uh, do, you, do you let your project get delayed or do you have a plan B ready? And I think um, that's really what we try to do. We try to work with the customers to say, what are the potential obstacles that are going to cause a problem? And then what would we do if this came up so that at least it's not a surprise, right? You've already talked about it. Um, I know we've got a large implementation going on right now with a, a very large distributor with over hundreds of locations. And they recently acquired a new company and, you know, they're going in a little bit of a different direction. And this new company had significantly different requirements, um, could have delayed their go live for up to a year to almost try to stop and, you know, reintegrate all of those requirements. And um, but the team, you know, had thought about what about acquisitions? What would we do? And the plan was, you know, hey, we're going to continue on and quickly move into a phase one and phase two if there are a lot of differences so that we don't disrupt the time to value of the initial project and then give the new company time to get absorbed because potentially they may actually be able to fit into the new business process. You don't really know them well enough yet, right? And then if not, start a phase two. So I think that's a really good example of sort of preparing for obstacles so that it's not a surprise. But we all know change is going to happen. And I think the more you can prepare for that, you know, the better. You know, and I think that's a key point here that I'd like to emphasize for our listeners is this idea, as you'd mentioned, Lisa, it's not a surprise because you already talked about it. And so being proactive and and having those conversations on the front end of a, a project where you are very transparent and you're very you know, honest about the realities and expectation of large scale ERP organizational change. And, you know, as you had mentioned, I mean, things come up, things change. Uh, so you got to be flexible. You got to be willing to bend a little bit, not expect uh, perfection because that's an impossibility uh, with these projects. But I think that just that idea of not allowing anything to be a surprise and just being proactive and transparent about what what's happening. And, you know, you'd mentioned uh, previously, Lisa, this idea of resource management, right? And you also mentioned, uh, you know, fatigue, this idea of fatigue, which is a real thing on these projects. And um, whether it's a three month project or six months project or a large global, you know, 12 to 24 month project or more, those are things that you have to really build into your project plan and be cognizant of, and then make sure that you're communicating with your end users. You know, if, if, if I'm an end user and uh, an ERP vendor comes in and they're going to do an implementation change and they don't let me know that, hey, the, the, the expectation here is that Jack is going to have to put 15 to 25 percent of his time or whatever that number is into this uh, ERP organizational change project and yet still do my day job, that doesn't take long to burn people out. So that's a great point. So, Lisa, as you know, the implementation process and methodology is crucial. What can you share with our listeners as to how you feel your implementation process at, at Epicor is a differentiator from other ERP vendors? Yeah, great question. I think it really does come down to our sub-vertical expertise, right? The knowledge that our consultants bring to the table in terms of best practices for that industry and the time to value. So I think our understanding the needs of global manufacturing, you know, the challenges of differentiation if you're a distributor and then how retailers are trying to compete with the Amazons of the world. And also many companies across these three areas we're actually seeing are becoming more of a hybrid where we'll have a distrafacturer, right? Where a distributor might actually now be doing some manufacturing as well to try to compete or differentiate. So I think our knowledge of that entire supply chain brings a unique understanding of what their suppliers and customers may need And that allows us to really um, bring some world-class results that that maybe other ERP vendors would not be as open to to really um, discussing and and reviewing with them. Mm. Um, I think the other big thing that we do is, we, like I said, we don't really view an implementation as done. We we have our customer value workshop about a year after implementation. Uh, We continue to do this through the life cycle of that partnership. And uh, we do come back, we make sure there's executive involvement in that to understand what's changed in their business. And then we really work to ensure that that company is leveraging all the software 
that we provided to them. And so that's part of our sort of uh, commitment to our customer engagement. It's not something we charge for. We actually feel like, especially if you're in a software as a service model, you know, it is all about the company using the software, uh, not just installing it. So that's probably for me, I think the, the big difference is that really deep industry capability and knowledge and then you know, the, the concept that, that we're never done, right? We want to continue to make sure that the value is realized. I like that, uh, Lisa. That's fantastic. You'd mentioned, I think, two or three times now in our conversation today, you know, this idea of long-term value and leveraging a tool and the partner for years to come, right, in terms of continuous improvement. So this idea that you just said, we don't view an implementation as ever done, I think is, is a great idea. All right, um, Lisa, um, a couple of more questions here, and I really appreciate your time today. This has been a fun conversation, and no doubt our listeners are learning some useful information and insights. But what are your thoughts on ERP software customization? You know that customization can be good in order to better fit the operational processes, but isn't too much customization a real danger? Yeah, I believe strongly in configuration, not customization. And again, I think that's probably just my um, lengthy knowledge of a lot of ERP systems and projects. You know, it's it's really important that it is easy to continue to take upgrades, right? And and obviously, in if you are in a software as a service model, these updates come fairly frequently. Um, customizations can cause challenges and, and problems with that or delays in those cycles. So whether you're on-premise or in the cloud, I think it's it's very important that you, you do really try to limit it. Um, if customizations can do outside the, the actual code base, and there are a number of ways that, that we sort of accomplish that, then you know that could be an area where um, you know it's it's still okay. But I think you know most of the time we see customizations, it's because they're trying to match something they did in their you know prior system. Um, I think it's it's usually something that, you know, the, the goal is to look at how the system today could still resolve and, and help you address that issue without having to make those changes. So that will always be our preference is to work with our clients on configuration, not customization. So, Lisa, you'd mentioned the idea of end users uh, comparing with the previous system. What would you say is, what's your experience with that? Would you say that that's pretty typical when you go from whatever system to Epicor, that that's just human nature for a while as they go through that, what we call the post go live, a, a little bit of a productivity dip and learning curve? Absolutely. And it's, it's actually great that you mentioned that. I mean, again, something we try to prepare the customer for, right? I mean, we'll go into some um, companies where they literally have users still using green screens where it's, you know, tab, tab, return. They know exactly when to type, tab, tab, right? They have the, the number of exact, yeah. you know, keystrokes memorized. Yeah. And, and so um, they're very quick at what they're doing. And so going to a, you know, a complete new user experience can be tough because they may be doing, you know, 10 things on one screen, and it may seem like it's taking longer, but the end result obviously is is, is much faster. Uh, so I think that just does take time. I think the way you get around that, again, is really good prep. Um, lots of user labs where, um, you know, they get a chance to really practice with the software ahead of time. And then I think it is just sort of feet on the ground when you go live, right? Uh, we had a customer go live in Germany over the weekend, you know, it was kind of all hands on deck, right? We had resources there, but also people available in the event that there were challenges or issues. And it's never the go live. It's usually, you know, the week or two after where people become unsure. So I think just making sure the support is there um, and that you're, again, you discuss it as a reality that this will happen. And then usually, you know, a month later, people can't, you know, even remember the, the old system. Yeah. That, that's so true. And, you know, if, if an organization goes through the proper selection, uh, I guess, method, as we've discussed today, that probably means that, first of all, they agreed that they had to do something different, right? On a very first question, I think it was, you talked about this idea of being adaptable and, and flexibility uh, within your organization. And sometimes that means changing your business solution. And so if you do that, and if you go through the process of finding the right fit, you know, as we discussed today, whether, you know, industry fit, business model, features, functions, you know, the intangibles that, that we talked about, 
then chances are probably pretty good that the system that you're ending up with is better than the legacy system that you had before. But despite that, there's always, it seems, and, and of course, this varies from organization to organization and from user to user, but usually you got to get past the the bit of the go live, uh, what we call the productivity dip or the learning curve and users come out on the other end. And, and usually what we see is they're like, wow, yeah, this is a better solution. Uh, this we, we made the right choice. You know, we did the right thing, despite the fact that those are probably the same people that, that throughout the process, they keep comparing to what they had before. And, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I think it's in part human nature uh-huh. and it's, it's in part, you know, part of the process. But um, it, it's always something that comes up on every project. Um, so, Lisa, last question. How would you summarize this conversation? Uh, that is, if you had to distill your work and your experience into three, four sentences or so, what would you say to our listeners in terms of how can they take what they learned from this podcast today and apply that to practice? Can you leave them with any golden nuggets? Well, I think, as I said, modernize your ERP. It, it is really your digital foundation. So I think that's you know kind of step one. I think step two, definitely move to the cloud where possible, right? There could be some geographies or certain industry compliance challenges in some cases where that may not be possible, but cloud is an enabler and it does free up your resources to focus on business and your customers, right? Instead of systems. I really do believe it's important to do diligence, right? So select carefully with assistance, don't rush, you know, and, and really take the time to get it right. And then finally, I think the main thing that we've all learned is focus on the business outcomes, not have this be a technology project. And I think that's, you know, those are the keys sort of for success at this point. Fantastic advice. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Um, Lisa, can you tell our listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about Epicor? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, It's Lisa Pope. I am on LinkedIn, so you're welcome to reach out to me. Uh, Epicor is also available on LinkedIn, and our website is epicor.com. But uh, my email address is also available on LinkedIn, so feel free to reach out. We're definitely interested in in working with with any of your listeners or private equity companies. But Jack, I I have to say, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about this. I think you brought up some incredibly great topics and points and certainly very key to customer success during this critical time. Well, thank you again, Lisa. Uh, It really was a pleasure and an honor to have you uh, join us today. We appreciate your time. Thanks again. We'll talk soon and uh, be well. Thank you. You bet. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of the ERP OCJ podcast. This podcast is intended as a forum to study, share, and discuss ERP organizational change successes and challenges. We discuss the people, process, and technological components of ERP organizational change by drawing on knowledge from extensive research, collaborative learning, and practitioner expertise and experience. We are incredibly grateful to have friends, colleagues, and mentors join us in our podcast as we seek to promote, connect, and foster relationships in the ERP organizational change community and contribute to its success by bringing research and practice closer together. We want to make sure this is the most useful and insightful ERP podcast you listen to, and we'd love your help in doing so by leaving us feedback and a review. A great place to do so is at Apple Podcasts. Just click on the Listen in Apple Podcasts link, then click Ratings and Reviews, and let us know your thoughts. You can get more info about the show, including show notes and episode highlights for this and all of our episodes by visiting nestleandassociates.com and clicking the podcast option. Please join us again next week as we discuss the latest ERP organizational change research, practice, and stories. And don't forget to follow us on social media, hashtag the ERP OCJ. Thanks again for listening. Have a fantastic week.